Hi, everyone. How you all doing? Everyone's having a good I.O., so um, thanks for coming here. So let's get started with this session. So our session today is all about bringing Android apps over to Android TV. So my name's Wayne Pekarsky, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. And I work in areas like TV and cast and the living room and wearables. And I, my, my goal is to you know, communicate information about these products to developers, but also to talk to you more and find out about what your needs are and feed them back to the product teams. So I'm Ryan. I'm a developer programs engineer at Google. And I build things for you guys, you developers, uh, you know, things like tools, API client libraries, and samples just to make your lives more productive. All right. So uh, today we're going to assume that you have some knowledge about Android development, because the goal is, is we're going to teach you how to take your apps and how to get them working on Android TV. So what's the motivation for this talk? Well, I've been talking to lots of developers out there. And I say, hey, have you done an app for TV before? And they're like, oh, you know, I don't think this is something I can do. It's too much work or whatever. And it turns out that most developers aren't fully aware of how similar Android TV is to Android itself. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if we did a talk about this and to show you the small steps that are needed to get your app onto the big screen? So if developers aren't doing this, why is this a problem? Well, right now there are millions of Android TV devices that are activated out there right now. And the number keeps going up every day. You can buy TVs with Android TV included. You can buy little set-top boxes that include Android TV as well. And they're really cheap and affordable, and a lot of people have these devices in their living rooms now. And these customers are looking for apps to use on their devices. So the important thing here is that if you go to an Android TV device and start up Google Play, not every app in the Play Store will appear on your device immediately. It turns out, as a developer, you actually need to take a few small steps and tell Google Play that your app is ready for TV, and then it'll make your app available. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to show you how to do this. And the good news is that Android TV is really easy to develop for. And so to quote my very famous colleague Ryan here, it's just Android. And so it uses the same SDKs, the same tools that you're familiar with, same Android Studio, and the same emulator tools. So you can get started really easy if you're familiar with Android right now. And so the basics are you got to tweak a manifest file, check a box in Google Play, and your app's ready. So that's the really cool thing about it, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the other thing is that you can actually make a single APK that you upload to Google Play that supports both TV and phone. That's how similar these things are. So the first thing with this talk that I wanted to sort of point out is that a lot of people think, well, Android TV is only useful for watching TV shows and movies. But I really think there's so much more possibilities for what you can do rather than just those things. So imagine you could browse photos and artwork. You could look at restaurant menus or houses that you're looking to buy, or exploring maps or 3D models or playing computer games. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities that really make the possibilities endless. And so Android TV really breaks down the possibilities of what we thought TV could be used for into so much more other things. And the other thing is that Android TV is the largest screen in your house. Every house has this massive screen that's in the living room, in the center of the house. And so it has huge possibilities for what you can do with it. And so that's what we're trying to encourage today, is for developers to think of new platforms and new ways of taking their apps and getting them out to consumers out there. So today, we're going to help you redefine what a living room experience could be and really create amazing apps. So I'll hand off to Ryan now, and he's going to go through some more of the steps of how to do this. Thanks. So the first step in bringing your app to Android TV is you're going to need to add a TV banner. This banner is going to provide the launch point for your app on the Android TV launch screen. So here's an example banner that uh, I've taken directly from our sample app, which is available on GitHub. Here is our sample banner alongside some official Android TV apps. This is what it would appear like on the Android TV launcher itself. So there are a couple of requirements that we would like you to follow when you're creating your TV banner. The first is that the banner should be 320 by 180 pixels. That's because Android TV, this is the size that it's going to display it at. And if you make your banner any other size, it's just going to stretch it and skew it in a way that you wouldn't really like. Um, the second is that 
your app name should appear readable in the banner itself. And the reason for this is on Android TV, the name of your app doesn't actually appear below the banner. And so we ask that you put it inside the banner itself uh, so that your users can understand what app they're clicking on when they open yours. So it's super simple to add. Um, it takes a single line in your manifest. I'm sure you're familiar with this. In your application tag, just add Android banner attribute and point it at your drawable resource. Super easy, right? Um, so if you did all this and you tried to run your app, nothing would actually happen. Um, just setting this banner doesn't get your app running on Android TV. And so next, I'm just going to talk about how you would declare the activity to launch when you click on the banner. So let's jump into it. So here's an activity. Uh, this may be your main activity in your Android manifest. Um, and you have an existing intent filter there with the action main and the category launcher. Um, so here, we're just going to add a second intent filter to your existing activity with the category lean back launcher. Um, the reason that we actually separate launcher and lean back launcher is because our best practices is that you're going to create your own TV specific UI and layouts eventually. However, for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to say, why not get started, throw it in your existing activity, and see how much it works? Like I said earlier, it's just Android, so you'd be surprised by how much works right out of the box. The next big difference on Android TV is the TV hardware itself. So mobile devices, you know, they can make phone calls, they can take photos, they use NFC, they have touch screens. TVs don't have any of these things. At least I, my TV doesn't have a touch screen. Um, and so for these reasons, we actually need to tell Android that these features that we may have come to expect on a TV or on a phone uh, will not be available on a TV. So the way that we do this is through our uses feature tag. And you guys, I, I'm sure, are all familiar with this. You declare the hardware features that you would like to use in your app manifest. And this is probably fine. You know, um, For phones and tablets, it's going to automatically set required to true. However, for Android TV and for TV hardware specifically, this hardware might not be available on TVs. And so um, we need to update that to required false so that, uh, so that the TV itself um, knows that, hey, I can still operate without this uh, hardware requirement. So one gotcha, actually, is that the touchscreen hardware requirement is by default required true, even if you don't declare that you need it. Um, and so we actually need to take this snippet that you see here and add it directly uh, right into your Android manifest. So another gotcha is that um, some permissions, actually, if, you're, if you ask for, like, say, a record audio permission, uh, it's actually going to imply this hardware requirement for a microphone. And this makes sense, right? You want to be able to record some audio, so you're going to need a microphone. Um, but the, you might not actually uh, declare the user's feature itself. And so um, what, we, what we have to do to get around this is just go into your Android manifest, declare user's feature tag, and set required to false. OK, so this is the most important part uh, about bringing your app to Android TV. This is the UI navigation and controls. So with no touch screen available on TVs, we have to rely on these minimal controls. And this is what brings us to the D-pad. So the D-pad, which also stands for directional pad, is the de facto way to navigate on Android TV. Now, this D-pad is not an entirely new idea. Some of the first phones actually use D-pad for navigation. And when we say navigation, what we're really talking about here is this intuitive change of focus. Touchscreens have revolutionized our ability to you know, tell our interfaces when I tap here, I want you to focus and take action at that specific point. However, on TVs, we don't have this same luxury because there's no touch screen available. So in order to focus, what we need to do is progressively shift our focus from element to element through our UI until we get to the one that we want. And on Android, there are a number of different ways that focus is handled and manipulated. And so I'm going to discuss each one of these briefly. So, First thing that you need to know about Android, uh, focus on Android, is this attribute called focusable. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. In simple terms, though, on Android TV, your users are going to be using a remote. So 
on, with any element that you want them to interact with, they, uh, the element itself should be focusable. And to do that, all we do is we set this focusable attribute to be true. So as an example use case here, where you may be creating some custom playback uh, layout, and it's, it has a play pause button here, which we've represented with an image view. Um, and you're going to want to be able to navigate to that play pause button so that you can eventually click it. Uh, so all we do is we just set focusable to true. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, a little bit of a gotcha, is that some views aren't, they don't set focusable to be true by default. Uh, image view is one of these. Uh, so in this case, we have to set it explicitly to true. Great. So now we can focus and select our play button. But what if we want to, say, press right uh, d on the D-pad and have it focus on the uh, fast forward button, or press left and have it focus on the rewind button? So we use these two other attributes, next focus right and next focus left. So by setting these two attributes as shown here, now Android's going to switch the focus automatically when you press those buttons on the D-pad. So there may be other times where you want to you know, create your views directly in Java code. And so specifying this focus in the XML is not going to be available to you. For example, you may be generating a lot of views, like a grid shown here. Um, and you're not going to necessarily be able to declare exactly what I should be focusing on at that specific point. So uh, we need some way to ask Android to change this focus. And we do that through this request focus uh, method, which is available on uh, the view class. So request focus just does exactly that. It requests, it asks Android to bring that view into focus if it is focusable. And that's a key point, if it's focusable. So be sure to make, sh make sure that that view is focusable set to true before you request focus, or else it won't do anything. So the last thing that I'd like to discuss here about the D-pad is what if you want to take some arbitrary actions when any key is pressed? So to do this, we're going to override the activities on key down method. This method fires when any key is pressed that isn't already handled by uh, one of these views inside of your activity. So an example here is that you could combine this on, uh, this on key down with request focus to change focus when any key is pressed. Or uh, a really common use case is if I press play pause button on the remote, it's going to play, I'm going to play or pause my uh, video. Or if you're making a game like I'm showing here, maybe when you press the right D-pad button, uh, you're going to move your player to the right. OK, so Ryan talked you through a little bit about focus and moving things around and so forth. Now we're going to talk a bit about the screen. So it turns out with televisions nowadays, they don't quite operate in the same way that we would expect. You would think that if you've got a 1080 HDMI signal and you feed it through to a screen, that you would get a one-to-one -one mapping. It turns out that's not quite the case. So I'm going to talk a little bit about something called overscan protection. So if we actually go back in time, back in the days of analog TV, there were these edges on the screen that were not used. And TV stations actually used to embed little signaling and bits of data and things like that in that area that wasn't displayed by the television. It turns out that when we moved to HD, that stuff still happened. And so a lot of TV manufacturers will actually take a TV image, and they'll chop off the edges, and then stretch the image slightly so it fits the screen. So what this means is that you don't get a one-to-one -one mapping, and some of the pixels on the edge actually get chopped off. So you can disable this on some televisions. There's overscan or some other feature like that that you can remove with the remote, but a lot of users don't know how to do it. So you need to be aware of the fact that there are some people out there who are not going to see the edges of the screen of your app, and so we need to go about dealing with that somehow. And so if we look at this diagram here, you can see that we have our 1080p um, overall display, and we've also shown it in terms of DPs, which is device pixels. And then you can show the areas that are not included. And we have a guideline, which is that you should roughly stick to not using the outer 5% of the image. And that's usually a safe thing. So if we look here, you can see we've got some UI elements, and we've got the edges protected so that we don't use them. So once again, a 5% outer area is something that you should reserve that your app shouldn't put anything important in. Now, if you have a background image, that's OK if that gets cropped, because it's just 
the, probably the interesting part is in the center of the screen. So background images can get cropped, but important pieces of text, labels, any kind of important information like that, you've got to make sure that you keep it out of that region. And so here, we have a custom layout XML that we're showing. We've got two relative layouts. And the inner relative layout, if you look at it, is padded with a 5% margin. So you can see we're setting margin top, bottom, left, and right. And we've set DP values that represent that margin. And anything we put inside that inner relative layout will not be cropped off by the television for any reason. Anything else that you don't care about, like the background image we talked about earlier, you can put that in the outer relative layout at the top. And that will possibly be cropped by the television. So this is pretty easy to implement. And it's not really a huge deal. But it's just something you got to keep in mind so that you make sure it works for all users. Next. Um, not everyone programs their Android TV apps using the Android API APIs directly. So there's actually a cross-platform gaming engine called Unity that's quite popular amongst game developers. And so the good news for Unity developers is that it actually supports Android TV out of the box. So Unity has support for the D-pad, so all that stuff Ryan talked about with handling the controls, that's already dealt with for you. And it deals with all the manifest tweaks and overscanning and making sure that everything's done right. So there's actually a code lab that we've prepared for Android TV. So if you go um, behind this auditorium, there is a code lab area where you can go and sit down and try out code and mess around. We have a, a code lab for Unity there as well that you can give a try. So that's the nice thing is that a lot of these extra tools and so forth support Android TV out of the box as well. So if you've got a game that does 3D and OpenGL and all that, it just works. So now we'll go to Ryan to talk more about the Leanback library, which is a very popular way of implementing really nice TV UIs. Thanks, Ryan. So you know, at Google, we're trying to make your lives easier as developers. And we know that you don't really want to implement all this stuff yourself. And so to help out, we created the Leanback library. It has a great selection of UI components that are specifically designed for Android TV. And these components come with support for D-pad, as well as overscan protection, already baked right in. So now I'm going to step through some of these components and, and explain why you may consider using this library. So the first component here that I want to discuss is this browse fragment. The browse fragment's good for, good for well browsing, right? Uh, it allows you to showcase all of your content in one place. And so one of the best places to use the browse fragment is when, immediately when the user opens this app. So here's an example of it being used in practice. This is what it looks like being run in our leanback sample uh, live, uh, app available on GitHub. And you can see here that there's a sidebar with some header rows and a main grid of content. So if you jump into a category by pressing right on the D-pad, uh, you can see a more detailed view of this content. Here we show some thumbnail images and title and category. These can be basically whatever you want. You could display a rating for your content. You could display a price, um, anything that you can imagine. Um, so if you select on one of these cards, then that brings us into another fragment that we call the details fragment. So the details fragment prevent, uh, presents all of the details for a specific piece of content. It allows your users to take certain actions, uh, anything that you can imagine, like watching, renting, buying this piece of content. So again, here it is in practice. And you can customize, of course, all these uh, colors, text, buttons um, to provide a personalized experience specific to that piece of content. So in this case, with our new dad uh, uh, video, we can click Watch Trailer. And then we get into another fragment that we call the Playback Overlay Fragment. So this provides a large customized controls that overlay on top of the media itself. It also provides an at-a-glance view of what's currently playing. So again, here it is in practice. It has a primary row, which provides things like play, pause, rewind, fast forward, next video, previous video, as well as a secondary row, such as closed captioning, picture in picture. Here I'm showing some thumbs up, thumbs down, and uh, uh, some repeat functionality. Um, and then hidden at the bottom there is a, re a related videos row. This is just a place that you can place you know, related content to whatever is currently playing. And so this could be where you recommend uh, the next video to play for your user. So if the users can't find this you know, next great piece of content to absorb uh, in this related video list, then 
you know, maybe search is the ne next best thing. And you know, being Google, we want to provide a great search experience. And so we've added the search fragment to the Leanback library. And uh, so here again is it in practice. And we're searching for the word search. And I think the best feature of this whole search fragment is speech recognition capability. So you can use the microphone, which is baked right into the Nexus Player remote, to speak whatever you want and have it, uh, have it immediately fill in the field. Um, so in addition to in-app search, we, you can also integrate with this universal search. So this is when a user searches from the main TV launcher for some related content, and that will get surfaced automatically by the Android system. So you can imagine you get home, you turn on the TV, and you search funny movies. If your app has some funny movies, you're going to want to surface that to the user. And so to integrate with Search, there's just a few things that you need to do. The first is implementing a content provider. And you might already have one of these. Maybe you're already using one for your in-app search. And so uh, you can see our documentation for all the specific rows that we support. But the, the key thing here is that the provider that you create you should set this attribute, exported true, so that Android has access to it and can query it when a universal search is made. And then the next thing is this searchable XML. And again, you might already have one of these implemented in your app already. And so what you need to do here is just set this include in global search attribute to true so that Android, again, can access this content. So even before search, your, your app might actually have a good idea of what the user wants to see next. And so Android TV has this powerful way uh, that we like to, uh, that we can help, which we call recommendations. So this recommendations bar is featured front and center as soon as the user opens up their Android TV. Android goes through app, each app and asks, hey, do you have any recommend recommendations that you'd like me to present to the user? And so it takes all of these from each app and it merges them together. And so when a user clicks on a recommendation, which would appear in this bar, uh, the, the, um, it'll immediately open your app to that piece of content. So here are a few recommendations on uh, what, what you may want to recommend to your users. The first is continuation content. You know, a good example is the next episode in a series. Um, as well as new content, things like new episodes or, or, or a new series altogether, as well as popular or trending content. And then related content. This is things like based off the user's uh, viewing history or behavior. And so all of these UI and fragments that we've shown you today, um, they're available through the Leanback and Recommendation Support Libraries, which if you're using Android Studio, which we highly recommend, um, you might be familiar with Gradle. Of course, we support the, uh, these Gradle dependencies. And so you just drop these two, uh, you drop these two lines into your uh, build.gradle, and Gradle will handle everything else. Wayne? So one common thing I hear from developers when they're asking about Android TV is they're like, oh, hey, you know, I can't develop for Android TV because I don't have a device on my desk. And so while it's nice to have a device, you don't actually need one because the emulator is actually available to help you do your testing. So a lot of people think the emulator also isn't good enough, but it turns out the emulator in Android Studio is actually really good. And so for Android TV, we've done a lot of work in improving its performance. And so it's actually really nice to use this for development. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to show you a quick little demo. So they're going to bring it up on the screen there. So this is Ryan's laptop running the emulator right now. And so this emulator here is the x86 variant. So it's very important that you run x86 when you're on an x86 laptop so that it doesn't have to emulate everything completely. And it's also important that you have the Haxam driver as well. So what you can see here is Ryan's running the sample that I'll give you the link to later. But the sample has a series of video clips, and he's browsing around fragments. And so do you want to fire up a video, Ryan? So this here shows video playback happening. So it's streaming the video. It's decoding it, playing it back within the emulator. So as you can see here, it's very performant. It's decoding the video in real time on his laptop. And so the emulator is quite useful. Also, if we look on the right of the screen, there is the extended controls. So an Android TV has its own remote with left, right, up, down. But it also has back, pause, play, and so forth. All of those controls are available 
on the emulator as well. So you can simulate every single button press and check that your code has all the right D-pad support and things like that, because not every button necessarily is mapped to the keys. So the great thing is that the simulator does all of the buttons that are available on regular devices, and you don't need to purchase a physical Android TV device. So this is pretty cool, and it's definitely, if you're interested in doing this, you should grab the sample, fire up the emulator, try it out, and then when you're ready, you can publish it, and your app will work really well on real devices too. So once you've built your app, so we've gone through all the different little manifest tags and things like that, we're now at the point where we need to talk about publishing your app to Google Play. So we have the, are we back? We on? can go back. To oh, yeah, if we can flip back from the, OK, great, thanks. Um, so now we're going to talk about how to get your app and publish it to the console. So if we go to this slide here, you can see a screenshot showing what the developer console looks like. So this is the same place where you upload your regular APKs that you're uploading from mobile. And there is an option in device categories where it says Android TV. And if you look right at the bottom there, there's a checkbox that says distribute your app to Android TV. So by default, that box is not checked. So if you want your app to be visible on TV devices, you have to check that box as well. That then declares to the play that your app is ready for TV, and there is a few little conditions there. And you can click on that Learn More link to find out more about what the requirements are. So you submit your app, it gets approved, and then after that, it'll then be available for people to find on Android TV devices. And then they can go to the play, and then they can search for your app by um, speaking or typing it in, and then they can install it just like they would on a phone. And updates are rolled out in the same way and everything like that. So it's a pretty easy and painless experience. And as I said earlier, you can either have a single APK that contains all of the resources and activities for both phone and TV, or you can have separate APKs where one has the resources and everything for TV and the other one has for phone. What you do is going to be dependent on who your target market is and how concerned you are about download sizes and also how much difference there is between the TV and the phone app. If there's no differences in the resources, you can just do a single APK. So we've gone through some guidelines in this talk. Um, the guidelines are actually referenced in the documentation. And there's actually a link here on developer.android.com which has a complete checklist of all of the things that are important to get your app approved to be distributed on, on Google Play. Now, it's important that you get your app approved because if it's rejected, it won't be visible. So it's very important that you actually think carefully about each of the guidelines to minimize the amount of time it takes for you to get it on, the, on Google Play. So let's quickly walk through them and summarize quickly what they are. So Ryan mentioned earlier, you need to have a lean back launcher in your Android manifest. This declares that your app is ready for TV, and it says what the activity is going to be when someone clicks on your app to start it up. You need a banner image that's 320 by 180 at XHDPI resolution. If you don't use that resolution, it'll be resized for you. You need to eliminate requirements for any unsupported hardware. Remember, TVs don't have touch screens, so you need to have touch screen equals false. And any other requirements you have, like if your app uses GPS, you're going to have to set that to false as well. And make sure that if your code is doing something like grabbing a location, check for errors to make sure that you don't accidentally fail and throw an exception. So as part of the new transition to the new permission model, apps have to check a lot more for these things. The same kind of thing here. You've got to make sure you don't expect a device to be available when it's not. Next thing. Um, ensure any permissions you add don't add hardware requirements as well. Certain permissions, like record audio that Ryan showed earlier, also have requirements that you have to manually set to required equals false. Next, you can't assume that your app is running on a portrait device. Like a phone runs as a portrait orientation, and some apps lock themselves so that they don't run in landscape mode. It's very important, because a TV is a landscape device, that your resources are configured correctly for screens like that. Next, you really need to think about viewing everything from a distance. So this is no longer something that you're running very close to your face. It's running on a screen that's very far away in someone's living room. So you really need to think of large fonts and easily, easy to read text and large images. And you should test it. So try to step back from the screen and check that it's actually readable from a distance like that. You know, Some people have poor vision. They're not going to be able to read super tiny writing like that. Next, 
make sure you think about overscan. We talked about that before. Make sure you don't put anything important within the outer 5% of your screen. And so lastly, think about implementing the lean back user interface. So if you've got an app that's like a game, you probably don't need to. But if you're building some kind of browsing, something that goes through media or food or pictures or photos, make sure that if you want to really make it integrate into the Android TV experience, that you use the leanback library. Because the leanback gives a consistent UI across the whole device that it'll look the same between other apps and also with the Android TV system itself. So those are the guidelines. And that link up there is available in the documentation. You should definitely look through them when you're getting ready to publish your app. So that was a really quick overview of how to bring your app over to Android TV. So I hope you found it inspiring, and it sort of gave you some ideas as to how to think about taking your app and what would be involved in making the change. It's not really hard to do. There's just a few little things. So how do we get started with this? Well, the first thing is the talk's being recorded. So if you want to review everything later on, you'll be able to go back and go through everything. But we also have a lot of other great resources, which are shown on this slide here. So the first thing we have is the documentation site. So on developerandroid.com, we've got training guides that sort of give an overview and sort of summarize some of the things we've said today. And then we also have the leanback sample. So it's on GitHub and the Google samples. It's called Android TV Leanback. And that demo that Ryan showed earlier is that sample there. So you can play with it, see how the videos stream, see how it works for you. And it's a really great way to sort of see how a well-built app works. And you could probably tear it apart and put your own code in there and so forth. The next thing I mentioned, we have the code labs in the other area where you can go over there and you can try out. You can sit down, play with some devices, and there are actually engineers on staff there who can help answer your questions as well. And we also have the sandbox. So there is an area over there with these large metal box crate things that we have an area showing TV and cast devices. Feel free to come by there. And we have people who work on the actual Android TV team ready to answer questions there as well. And also, people like me and Ryan will be there too. So we're getting to the end of the day, so there's not too much time left. But please do come by after the talk and come have a chat with us. Because the whole point of Google I.O. is we want to share information with people and get information from developers. If you've tried to do Android TV and something didn't work out for you, come and tell us what happened so that we can think about it and maybe come up with a solution for you. And finally, for people who can't come here or for later, we have a great developer community on Google+. So the link is g.co Android TV Dev. And it's a great place where we post articles about what's coming up, what's new. And also, it's a place where you can ask questions and chat with other developers. And definitely, I recommend you follow us, because I post a lot of articles about TV, but also I do wearables and auto and all these other things. And there's a lot of commonality between the platforms that Google offers. And so if you've got a phone app, you should consider TV and auto and wearables, because these are all new, exciting platforms where users are waiting for really cool and exciting apps. Thank you very much for coming, and we'll Thank see you, you later. Thanks a lot.